Good morning. I'm Bill Brown, pastor of Ruffner Memorial Presbyterian Church in Charleston, West Virginia. My computer tells me that we have been meeting together online for 25 weeks. I'd love to see all of you in person and get back to normal, but that doesn't look possible right now. Last week, a church in St. Albans, West Virginia, not far from us, announced an outbreak of multiple COVID-19 cases. They have closed in-person services and are now having to have their services online. Obviously, it takes only one person to infect many others in close proximity. And with school opening, that increases opportunity for the spread of COVID-19 even more. Recently in Southern West Virginia, an off-campus high school gathering resulted in a spike of infections in that area. I still see people in grocery stores without masks or with their masks at half-mast. I have to wonder if they even care that their carelessness could result in the death of an elderly or compromised person. In the book of Genesis, we read the story of Cain and Abel. Cain was so angry and jealous of his brother Abel that he killed him. That's when Cain asked, am I my brother's keeper? But what he was really saying was my brother is not my problem. The next time you see someone in a public setting without a mask, that is exactly what they are saying. You're not my problem. Keep in touch. Wear a mask in public. Stay well. And may God bless you and keep you safe. Pray with me, will you? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for our family and friends and for the opportunity of joining together in this time of worship as we lift up our prayers in joyful praise and thanksgiving for all the goodness and, and grace you have given us. Thank you for providing for our daily needs and for the many blessings that you have given each one of us in such abundance. Thank you for our daily bread, our homes, our health, and the love we share together. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus, who died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Help us during this stressful time to be good and faithful witnesses to the good news of the gospel of grace. May we always reflect the love of Jesus in our lives to your greater glory. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, the first through the ninth verse. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by the grace, by grace, you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is the word of the Lord. What is grace? A simple definition is unmerited favor. But let's look a little deeper. By God's grace, you have been saved, we read in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By God's grace, you have been sanctified, we see in Acts 13, 43. By God's grace, you, have, you are to serve, we see in Ephesians 4, 19. By God's grace, you have been and you are sustained we read in 2 Corinthians 13.10. To start, <clears throat> I want to read you an excerpt from Max Lucado's book, In the Grip of Grace, where he writes about Jeffrey Dahmer. For those of you who have forgotten the name, he was a serial killer during most of the 1980s. He begins chapter four by saying, you know what disturbs me most about Jeffrey Dahmer? What disturbs me most is not his acts, not even his trial as disturbing as that was. May I tell you what does? His conversion. Months before another inmate murdered him, Jeffrey Dahmer became a Christian, said he repented was sorry for what he had done, profoundly sorry, said he put his faith in Christ, was baptized, and started his life over again. Began reading Christian books, attending chapel, sins washed away, soul cleansed, past forgotten. That troubles me. It shouldn't. But it does, says Max Locato. Grace. We all want grace for ourselves, but giving grace can sometimes be another matter, or even witnessing someone receiving grace that we feel isn't deserved seems inappropriate, unjust, almost immoral. Perhaps we feel that way because we fail fully to understand grace. So what is grace? The definition of grace is free and unmerited favor, especially from God. But what does that mean? Grace is the giving of favor that's undeserved. Now, 
we can understand the, de the definition, but we struggle with the application. We understand the giving of grace to those who aren't really all that bad. That's okay. But what about those who really don't deserve it? What about, the, what about them? Do you see where our understanding of grace is flawed? We think it's okay to give unmerited favor as long as it's not really all that unmerited. Not like to Jeffrey Dahmer. In cases like that, we often feel that it is all right not to give grace because he really doesn't deserve it. This is why we struggle. Because we really fail to understand grace ourselves. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, 7, and 8, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He lavished his free and completely unmerited favor upon us who absolutely did not deserve it. And he wants us to understand the magnitude of his gift. There's a sign on the side of a plumber's van. It reads, there is no place too deep, too dark, or too dirty for us to handle. What a wonderful explanation of God's grace. Ephesians 2, 1 through 7 tells us, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and, th and thoughts. We were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God raised us up with Christ to be seated in, with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We often think it is someone else who really needs God's grace. The fact of the matter is, it is you and I. It is you and I who were disobedient, living in ways that gratified the cravings of our sinful nature. We can't look at Jeffrey Dahmer's, the Jeffrey Dahmer's of this world and say they don't deserve God's grace without looking at ourselves and realizing that we don't deserve God's grace either. And that, and that is the point. Grace is undeserved. Last Sunday, we, we told the story of Zacchaeus. What did he do to deserve God's grace? Well, I'll tell you what he did. He sought it. In doing so, he received it. He gave half of his wealth to the poor to re not to receive grace, but because he had received grace. It was the result of Jesus' free gift of grace. Now, even as we understand grace from a theological perspective, it is um, imperative we understand it from a practical perspective so we can grow in our understanding of not only God's grace, but in understanding it from the standpoint of our real need for it in all things. So practically speaking, what does this grace do for us? By God's grace, we're saved. 
Martin Luther read this passage and it changed everything for him forever. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now many of us can quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 by heart. But often we are so busy looking at those who really don't deserve God's grace that we miss the point. We all need his grace. We look at other people and we think, well, at least we're not as bad as they are. We're not a thief, a drug dealer, or a murderer. We only need a little of God's grace to be saved. Wrong. How dare we focus on other people's needs and ignore our own? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Remember in Matthew 20, 1 through 15, Jesus tells the story of the workers in the vineyard. The landowner hires workers at various times during the day, starting very early in the morning and hiring the last late in the day. All were paid the same wage for their work. God is gracious. Without God's generosity, with his grace, we would all be lost. The fact that he is, from our point of view, more generous to some than others does not mean God has not been good to all of us. It is who he is, generous and gracious. Let us not be like the workers who were upset that he was, from their perspective, more generous and gracious to others than he was to them. Instead, realize that because of his generosity and graciousness, you have eternal life that you would never have otherwise. Be thankful that by his grace, he saved you. Now, God not only saves us by his grace, but by his grace, we are sanctified. When Paul was on one of his early missionary journeys, he was preaching to a crowd the message of salvation. And we are told many believed. We read in Acts 13, 43, when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. How do you continue in the grace of God and receive this progressive sanctification? Through his word. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. It is in God's grace that he continues to sanctify us, to grow us in the likeness of his Son. And the sanctification process happens through the reading of his word. Acts 20, 32 tells us, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God continues to sanctify and transform us by his grace we are saved we are not given grace to just sit around and do nothing he gives us grace to transform us and use us it is by God's grace that he gives us abilities and gifts with which to serve 
but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. We read in Ephesians 4, 7. God's grace gives us each gifts so that we can serve. Again, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4.10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to, say, to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. God's grace is poured out on on us so that we can be used by him to serve others when we do not let ourselves be an outlet for God's grace through our service we do not mature in the sanctification that God is giving us ask where you can serve what gift or gifts has God given me? So now let's think back. God saves us. He sanctifies us to serve, but he also sustains us. Paul tells us of visions that God showed him, and he talked about how God was asking him Paul talks about having a thorn in his flesh that tormented him. We don't know what that thorn in the flesh was, but it gave him weakness. Paul said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I don't know about you, but there are times I feel completely spent. Like the well has run dry. But then I realize that I have stopped relying on God and have been relying on myself. When we find ourselves in, in those times of weakness and need, the author of Hebrews tells us, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In our times of weakness, stress, and worry, as we turn to God, He strengthens us to endure and sustains us by His grace. It may seem cliche, but the poem footprints in the sand holds a great truth. Perhaps you've never heard it. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was only one set of footprints. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I could see only one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, You promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always but I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there have only been one set of footprints in the sand. Why then, why when I have needed you most, you have not been there for me? And the Lord replied, the times when you have seen only one set of footprints in the sand, I was carrying you. The Lord sustains us through his grace. Have you been trying to live your life apart from the gift of God's grace? You can't do it, you know, not effectively. 
His grace is our only hope for a joyous, productive life. And he is willing to give us his completely unmerited favor. It's absolutely incredible when we begin to fully understand his grace. You can't do it alone. His grace is your only hope. Remember, we grow in grace as we respond to his grace. Make that commitment today. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you both now and forevermore. Be at peace.